Uh, thank you, Robert. And I want to thank the uh, Masari and Mayni team. And I apologize for not being able to attend in person. I do hope to attend. I, I mean, I hope, you know, here in Israel right now, COVID has been on the rise. It's uh, hopefully going down a bit. So, so I do hope to attend future conferences in person. I'm planning, hopefully, on attending indeed the Stanford Blockchain Week. We'll also be at uh, other conferences. Anyways, um, so I have a short presentation and I'll be happy Thank you. Uh, later on to answer questions. I'll speak for five minutes and then just answer questions. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yep. Looks perfect. Okay, okay so um, hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from afar. Um, I'm Ellie, the co-founder and president at Starkware. So five minutes, uh, a little bit of a uh, proof of work, what we've been doing over the past, uh, you know, since we last met. So there are really two main points I want to make here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about StarkX, which is the largest L2 by transactions per second. Uh, it is roughly one quarter of Ethereum's on the rise. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I also want to tell you about StarkNet. And the main piece of news I want to share with you is that we're now committed to launching our alpha mainnet, which means that this is the mainnet on which people can actually deploy um, in two months, meaning in you know, November of this year. So everyone's working really hard on this and we're extremely excited. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about StarkX and then about StarkNet and then answer questions. So a bit about Starkware. As, as Robert mentioned, our pedigree is that we uh, we're proud to say that we invented pretty much all of the stuff that we're deploying and building our products on. This includes, of course, ZK Starks and their building blocks, such as Fry and Air. It includes the programming language in which all our products are written, Cairo. It includes uh, innovations and inventions like Sharp, shared proving, which allows several different systems to be uh, serviced on one single proof. Validium, which is an innovative data availability model that is now embraced by others in our uh, space, Volition. Our mission is to take all of this technology stack and bring it to, to blockchains all over to give you better scalability and privacy. Um, we have two main product lines that we'll go into detail in a little bit, StarkNet and StarkX. Our team has more than 50 um, folks. Uh, most of them, roughly three quarters, are engineers. Uh, the rest are a lot of researchers, blockchain researchers. And we received $110 million of funding inequity and a, a very nice grant from the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so, I mean, uh, I mean, the grant part of it was an ETH. So like, I think 20 minutes ago, it was a little bit more, but you know, no complaints there. Anyways, uh, so a little bit about StarkX. As of two days ago, the numbers have been going up since then. Uh, I just saw that over the past 24 hours, for instance, DYDX has been uh, doing a volume of more than $2 billion for the 24 hours, the last 24 hours. So these numbers are not updated. Um, we've done up to two days ago, $34 billion of cumulative trading. We settled over 16 million transactions. Uh, we're servicing over multiple different um, uh, customers, more than 100,000 users. Uh, in the NFT space, we have two uh, large partners, um, Sorare, that just announced uh, as of today that they've completed a round of funding to the tune of $680 million, which is, is an amazing uh, achievement. They're doing fantasy soccer and signing up a lot of the most uh, prestigious uh, leagues in, in Europe and in the world. Um, and Immutable, um, which is servicing uh, you know, multiple different platforms, including its own Gods on Chain. Uh, for these two uh, partners, we've minted over close to 8 million NFTs um, at a cost of, you know, fractions of a cent per NFT. Um, we've uh, maxed our, um, we, we've hit the uh, sort of world record for 600,000 NFTs in a single proof. And the customers of, 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 of our customers are right now experiencing gas per transaction, which is the lowest across all L2s, uh, around 800 gas per transaction. Okay, um, here's a little plot of the number of transactions per week over the past few weeks. Uh, we're, we're nearing the 2 million transactions per week um, across all, all different systems. The largest uh, one contributing to this 
uh, TPW is DYDX. Uh, we're capable of servicing uh, 1,000 TPS and doing so at taking no more than 10% the gas cost of Ethereum. And I just want to mention that one transaction of DYDX is a very complicated one. So it's roughly like, you know, something like five ERC20 transactions. Um, so here's a, our TPS or transactions per week compared to Bitcoin. We're already doing more than Bitcoin on our systems and we're roughly one quarter of Ethereum. So that's what I have to say about StarkX. Um, StarkNet is going to be just like Ethereum. It's going to be decentralized, permissionless, validity-based rollup, also known uh, as a ZK rollup, even though it doesn't really have zero knowledge, but it does have uh, Stark proofs. Uh, so it's a validity rollup. It's scalable, secure smart contract, layer two network. Already on the alpha, which is currently on, on testnet, everyone can access it. You can deploy uh, permissionlessly both uh, transactions and smart contracts. It already has L1, L2 interactions and composability between different contracts. And by the time we launch, there are also going to be ERC20 contracts. So you can deploy you know, ERC20 tokens on it. There's going to be L1, L2 bridges. You can bring your ERC20 tokens from mainnet Ethereum onto Starknet. This is all... Uh, coming on November. There'll be account contracts and a lot more. Um, I put here the QR code if you want to join the Discord servers and read more about uh, um, the mainnet launch uh, and just join the community, which is growing very rapidly. Um, we, there's an ecosystem. I invite everyone, you know, if you're a developer looking for some project where you want to be one of the first to join it uh, with all that that means. So we already have two separate teams working on full nodes for StarkNet. Those are Aragon, TurboGeth, and Equilibrium. Uh, we have Nevermind doing two really cool projects, the Solidity to Cairo compiler known as Warp. There's a beautiful Medium post that was posted just today by Craig, uh, the person who's developing this really beautiful stuff. There's a Block Explorer, Voyager by them. Uh, there's another set of compilers being written by other parties from other languages, not just from Solidity. And the standardization of the contracts is being done by no other than Open Zeppelin, who also standardized Ethereum. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I'll just sum up. Two products. We've been alive for four years as a company. Um, one is StarkX and the other one is StarkNet launching soon. Uh, happy to answer questions. All right. Well, that is a really good, uh, good run through of all the technology. Um, I um, appreciate, uh, I enjoyed prepping a little bit for this session just because you guys this year have just, you know, um, uh, I know you put out medium posts and other things, but um, you know, it, it, it's, you're doing tremendous amount of work. It's like, you know, the duck, very graceful on the surface, but tremendous Thank amount you. of little paddling cool. underneath the surface. Um, yeah. uh, so let's see, uh, one thing that, um, um, uh, that I think will highlight uh, a question from the audience, and I think it will allow us to get into discussion around a little bit of the programming model, but uh, there's a question about, you know, what, what really distinctly separates uh, Starkware, sets it apart from, you know, other L2 solutions, whether it's optimistic rollups or other people that are doing ZK rollups. Um, so just give you a chance to answer that. Yeah, so, so I, I got these questions in advance, so I prepared, prepared something uh, you know, to talk about. Um, so here's the question, what sets Starkware apart from other uh, uh, L2 solutions? And I'll give it two answers. First, the, you know, the fraud proof based, uh, which is the optimistic rollups. So we are part of the validity proof uh, based, you know, things based on validity proofs and things called often zero knowledge proofs. Um, Starkware is one of them. So the advantages over optimistic rollups are three main ones. We have faster finality uh, because we don't have this fraud proof or arbitration mechanism, which translate into better capital efficiency. Um, and we've seen, you know, if you go back to the days of lightning, you can see what the effects of, of limited capital efficiency has on the, uh, you know, on the long-term potential of the solution. So we think we're better in that respect. Another point we're better at is there's better security in the following sense. So if, like, assume that someone compromises all of the nodes that are needed to operate the, um, you know, the, the, uh, these two systems, an optimistic rollup or a validity-based rollup. So in our case, in the validity proof-based model, you can never put the system in a situation where uh, funds are, are stolen. 
you can you can stall the system, which is very bad, but you can't steal funds, okay, even if all the operators do, so that you have better security. And the last thing, which probably is most important, um, is that you have better scale. So you don't have to put the witness on chain. Here's, I'm going to share the slide, so there's a lot of numbers here. But if you look at the estimates, uh, you know, reasonable estimates for how much footprint you're going to have on an optimistic rollup, if, if, you know, if there are a lot of transactions on it, uh, compared to what you'll have on a validity proof, you, you can see that in the validity proof case, it's, it's much, it's much, much leaner because you don't need all the witnesses for them. And this is something that plays out, for instance, over the DYDX system, where we process a lot of uh, you know, uh, timestamps and proof uh, and, and, and price oracles over a very short period of time. Um, compared to other um, uh, solutions commonly known as uh, ZK SNARKs, there are Plonks and Graph 16. So we have a technology that for scaling Ethereum has been delivering, you know, largest TPS in volume today among all of these L2s and it's been doing it for a very long while. We have the most efficient uh, provers and that's the real bottleneck of all these uh, proof systems. And we also have the lowest amortized gas cost in production uh, per transaction. Um, we also have a better future proof technology, one that is uh, post quantum secure, uh, transparent, there's no need for any trusted setup, and uh, the security assumptions are go back the longest and are the leanest, so, so it's a uh, safer technology. Um, that's what I have to say on this question. All right, great. I love that you actually put a couple of points together on the slide and that you're going to share them. That's uh, very helpful for people who want to uh, take a look at this because I know. There's a number of sessions going on, so even people here at the conference have to make choices. Uh, and we've got a tremendous number of people I know watching this conference virtually. Um, you know, the next question, if you, uh, it was kind of a little bit longer in the way it was asked from the audience. I'm gonna sort of do a little bit of a spin. If you've been watching the earlier sessions, I kind of uh, said this statement that a year ago, you know, it wasn't as clear to everybody of how critical EVM compatibility was going to be. Uh, in the sense of developers voting with their feet, um, where you know if EVM compatibility is available somewhere, even if it's something that has you know essentially none of the security assumptions of any rollup, fraud proof or validity based, um, you see a lot of developer activity and you see uh, you know DeFi projects moving on to them for that reason. And so you know we've seen now that that's become front of mind for everybody is you know table stakes that making that transition as smooth as possible is, is really important. So you guys did something tremendous you know, last year, which was producing this Cairo language, which went from effectively uh, an ASIC model of building a new ZK circuit for every problem to instead building a virtual machine that programmers could program to, and the virtual machine was established by a standard VM circuit that evaluated the program. So it essentially moved, you know, moved us to programming uh, real programming models for zero knowledge. But of course, Cairo is not EVM, you know, it's a different uh, uh, base language. So you, you mentioned two things, on your, uh, two things on your slides. One was this Nethermind project, which is a transpiler. And then the other one that you mentioned that was related to Cairo was Open Zeppelin, which I presume is actually doing builds of uh, contracts uh, directly in Cairo. Uh, yes. Because it, directly in Cairo is where you're going to get the most efficiencies, right? versus going through the transpiler. So how, how is that changing your roadmap for the future? How important is EVM going to be? And you know, I know people are actually working on trying to have direct EVM ma machines that have a circuit running for them. Is that something that you guys are now considering on the advanced research side? Yeah, so uh, I also had uh, I also had uh, you know prepared an answer to this. This was a question. So now Definitely. you know that we have an EVM compiler in the works, and this is of course the, the work of Nethermind. Greg Wardy there. He just uh, posted a beautiful uh, um, blog on his up uh, you know on his latest updates. Um, I urge you to read it uh, from it. So uh, what's go how do we see it? Are we going to be just uh, you know you're just going to write EVM or Solidity? So I think the answer is no. Uh, transpiler is a really excellent entry point. So I guess programmers out there, you know, everyone knows Python and you program in Python and there are transpilers from Python to C++ and Rust. Um, however, when you're building real products and you need like efficiency, you're not gonna build it in, in Python. You're gonna build it probably in some more performing language. And 
why is that the case, right? Why isn't Python the only thing you need to know in order to get efficiency? Well, that's the way the world works. I mean, programming languages, um, they have a certain rationale and certain trade-offs. And when you automatically um, you know, transpile from one to the other, you won't get the same kind of efficiency. So a transpiler is an excellent entry point and you can quickly uh, see what kind of performance, uh, initial performance, and just see that the functionality works and you know, it's really good for that stuff. But um, you're probably going to see most of the, uh, you know, most of the volume and the action is going to be happening on code that is written in, in you know, for StarkNet using native Cairo. Um, and the main reason is even something different. There, when you're writing your smart contracts for Ethereum, you're doing a lot in order to minimize the gas limit. And this means, among other things, minimizing the amount of computation. So that really is a very major point. Now, if you're moving to StarkNet, the main thing that you're benefiting is that now there's no more gas limit, or rather the gas is much, you know, the price per computation is much, much lower. So you can do much more. And you, you, you're gonna want to rewrite your system, even if it was in solidity. And you'll get much more efficiency if you're gonna rewrite it in the language that is that gives you the best scale. So you're anyway gonna rewrite your code, even after you have a transpiler, um, because you now can benefit from other stuff. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, if you're buying a GPU or if you're uh, uh, writing a game uh, and, and you're gonna write parts of it for the GPU, you're uh, at some point going to rewrite significant parts of the code in something like CUDA because you know that it's going to work on a GPU and it just lo looks very different from a CPU and you're going to benefit from it. So that's the answer to the question. The transpiler will be a very good entry point, but uh, the real uh, performance stuff is probably going to be written in native Cairo for StarkNet. Okay. Hey, that's a really helpful answer. I would sort of, the short version of all of that, I would say what you're asserting, which is a good assertion uh, here, is that the EVM compatibility question is the most relevant on optimistic rollups and sidechains. But for ZK rollups, fundamentally, the technology changes enough at that base layer that um, you know, from a developer standpoint, uh, that's the transition time to another language. So yes. and that, is, that is the bet that you guys are making. OK. That is very cool. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I've been sort of asking, uh, you know, previous two speakers, and I'm going to ask you as well, uh, what are you seeing uh, in terms of, you know, when you're doing, you guys, you guys started out in some sense, some startups go off and they have to do a plan B pivot to something major and different. And I remember in 2018 at DevCon, you had that special session, you know, off campus. And yes. right there, you talked about and identified you guys were going to get uh, a DEX was going to be the first thing that you were going to launch. And you know, years later, uh, you guys did that and successfully. And so kudos to you, not having to uh, make any major, major changes. Um, there have, of course, been some changes now. NFTs and especially art NFTs caught everyone by surprise. We heard that from the OpenSea founder. Always thought it was going to be in-game value. And now art is incredibly valuable, digital art. Um, you have, uh, you know, so rare, immutable X. Um, in spaces like that, uh, as well as in DeFi spaces, is uh, sort of the belief of your team, and you're driving towards this idea that uh, there will be an L2, uh, you know, uh, a winner takes all, uh, layer two system, or you know, has your team kind of uh, felt that it's going to be bridging between L2s, and that most of the DeFi protocols are going to exist in different venues simultaneously um so about the winner takes all i don't know i i don't like that as an outcome and i frankly i'm not sure that's what's going to happen i think we'll see an ecosystem um several different scaling solutions i think my analogy is like for scaling um you know uh let's say uh, uh communications so you have optic fibers you have satellites you have uh uh, microwave, uh, you know, antennas and a whole bunch of things, and you're using all of them. So I think it's going to be something like that. Now about uh, NFTs, uh, you know, what the, the I'm not sure if this was the question you wanted to ask, or is this another question? Um, you know, what's what's the future of NFTs going to look like in Starkware? So Robert, is that a question you wanted to ask? Or uh... I think this question here is uh, just leave it for the slide deck. The the closing question I had for you is about. 
your view on the space of how much it was going to consolidate around kind of a winning L2. Uh, you know, clearly in the ZK space, you guys have done tremendous work in that space. Um, or do you feel like we will be looking at a future where uh, users should expect there to be two or three or four major L2s that they're kind of moving along through their MetaMask or their favorite wallet? I'd like, uh, because I, I'm much more of a, I don't know, I like, uh, I like to uh, have a friendly outlook on the world. So, so I, I very much like, I mean, because some of the other teams in the space, they're really doing amazing job. You know, the um, Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, uh, the Matter, Aztec, they're, they're really uh, superb innovators and researchers. And I, I, hope, I, I, I wanna see room for all of us. I think, you know, the world is big enough for it. Real competition is, uh, right, the conventional world. And so, so that's what I hope will play out, but the market is gonna decide ultimately. All right, I think we'll close it on that. I think that's a great sentiment, um, you know, compete, but, uh, you know, wish for everyone to do well. And, um, you know, I think uh, real pleasure to talk with you today. And, you know, thank you for sharing your, your updates. I thought you were gonna show us the planets constellations view of the roadmap as well. But for people, go and look well, at the- I can, I can send that slide in the deck. Yeah, <laughs> maybe put it in there for people when they download it as well. It's a beautiful slide sure. for the vision going to multi-operator, multi-app. All right, thanks. Let's give a round of applause for Eli and for all of our sessions. Thank you. Thank you.